but I need it too. Well, um, while I'm getting this started, I just want to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've never been to Bilbao. It's a beautiful city. Um, Okay. Um, so I was asked to talk about a fairly broad topic, and I think in a meeting like this, where we have so many luminaries covering this topic, it's a difficult thing to contribute to. Um, what I'll try to do is uh, frame sort of our conventional ideologies, some of which you've heard, and then move into the less conventional. These are my disclosures that um, uh, describe some of the funding for some of the work that I'll be describing. Um, I know that to this audience, we have the sense that we have this massive set of data supporting an aggressive approach to gliomas, and so therefore, um, that is really the reality of how we practice medicine in the world. The, but the reality is, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of convincing the world that this is the approach to be taken. Certainly, the people in this room subscribe to that ideology, but I can tell you, in the United States, every week I see patients that have expanding masses that have been watched to manage with AEDs, et cetera. So my message is to continue with this avalanche of data, and much of this avalanche is provided by people in this room. And much of the best evidence is provided by Europeans, and the studies that I use to, to quote for patients and to my colleagues are studies like these that are as close to randomized studies as we'll get in terms of prospective uh, studies looking at um, centers that have different practices, whether it's biopsy versus initial resection, and showing us that when we look at the median survival of these parallel cohorts, there's certainly a survival benefit. And this has been presented in multiple studies um, out of multiple countries. Um, with respect to what we should be trying to achieve with surgical resections within the limits of neurological function, I usually quote a, a couple key studies. Um, this study out of San Francisco, I think, has, has stood the test of time in terms of showing us uh, the thresholds for extent of resection and the value of incremental increase. I usually talk about these three studies as, in my mind, the benchmark studies validating the, uh, the value of gross total resection uh, in a volumetric way and showing us realistic expectations for five-year survival. Obviously, Dr. Defoe and others have really educated us on the impact of extended resection on tumor biology, the fact that you can dramatically change the risk of transformation with a low grade. Um, this, this publication by Johan shows that extended resection dramatically changes the profile of uh, seizures in patients and um, that those seizures themselves, when they do happen, are predictive of outcome. So um, our ability to impact the biology of the tumor affects the patient in multiple ways. It's not simply just a metric for overall survival. And we and others have looked at how you get to certain benchmarks of excellence. And for us, that would be uh, Engel-1 status seizure control, which we see in our patients at about 80% extent of resection or beyond for low grades. And we've heard over and over today the value of supertotal resections, obviously in a select population, but that is the point, is to be selective and then be aggressive in the right circumstance. When we're talking about low grades, uh, or when we're talking about insulars, rather, and low grades in particular, um, we see all of these same ideologies and concepts borne out in the data. Improvement in progression-free survival, improvement in overall survival, improvement in malignant progression-free survival, and we see the significant increase when you get to the highest levels of extended resection in terms of transformation rates. So um, what remains to be done, though, and I think, again, to revisit this idea that our work is not done in terms of ferreting out this entire idea, is looking at tumors with respect to the tumor biology itself 
you've all seen data for hemispheric low grades, for insular low grades, showing all of these advantages to extent of resection. But when we look at more specific molecular subtypes, even today, even this month, we're seeing publications that don't necessarily support the data from the rest of the types of tumors that we see. Our group ourselves have looked at malignant transformation rates in 1P19Q co-deleted oligos and have been unable to find a, a transformation rate benefit with extent of resection at least over a 10-year follow-up. Um, just recently, this past month, um, a large study came out of a group led from, uh, by Clark Chen at UCSD looking at a large national database in the United States, which is flawed, as a national database is, but nevertheless showing uh, really no benefit for extent of resection for oligodendrogliomas. And, you know, they review the literature to look at other studies that have also shown no benefit, and ours was one that did show a benefit, but it was the, the exception. So this, this data is out there as well, and, and as much as we all believe in the value of extent of resection and cytoreduction, as much as we know that biopsying and watchful waiting are increasingly a thing of the past, as much as we know that extent of resection impacts overall survival and transformation, we have to keep pushing with this data, and we have to keep making the case to the rest of the world that doesn't attend this kind of meeting. Now, when it comes to achieving the best possible results, we've heard of some of the techniques and technologies that people use. Um, if you take a back-of-the-envelope calculation of just extent of resection results in the literature today, uh, our rate of quote-unquote gross total resection for both low grades and high grades is not as high as you would like. Um, for high grades, it's pretty similar to what we've seen with the European 5ALA study, which is effectively a randomized study for extent of resection for glioblastoma. For low grades, it's much less, and obviously part of that is the metrics with how we, me we, we measure extent of resection. So let me just highlight some of the techniques and technologies that I think we all should be employing. And um, uh, you'll, you'll notice some things that are very similar to what Dr. Defoe advocates for, and then there are some things that are uh, um, a little bit different. Um, employing natural subarachnoid planes can be a real advantage when you're trying to reach a lesion. Using different plans of approach and corridors so that your entry point to a tumor is really the least invasive and the least eloquent territory you can go through. Patient positioning, I think, is a lost art in neurosurgery. And patient positioning, when you're taking advantage of gravity dropping or exposing certain arachnoidal planes, is especially effective. And obviously, we've heard a lot about intraoperative mapping, and I would echo all those sentiments. On the side of technology, in Europe especially, fluorescence guided surgery is here, and it was recently, 5ALA was recently approved in the US by the FDA just a couple weeks ago. Um, while I don't use it routinely, technologies like intraoperative MRI, intraoperative ultrasound, intraoperative CT are all uh, things that can provide value in the right context, and I'm, I'm not, I'm agnostic effectively to those, to those technologies, but if it's useful, I don't see any reason not to use it. Um, unlike um, Dr. Defoe, I, I think that um, I see more of a parity between transsylvian approaches to the insula versus transcortical. And while I favor transcortical, certainly a good portion of my cases and at my center are done transsylvian. Arachnoidal dissection can be helpful in the right circumstances where you're getting, uh, you know, areas of the brain that are uninvolved with the disease process out of the way and then working your way into exactly where the problem is. Um, Arachnoidal dissection itself is really something that comes from the vascular surgery realm as much as tumor surgery, and I, it's been instructive for me to work with vascular neurosurgeons that do tumor operations, at least in this respect, and you can get very good results, obviously, with that. Um, a patient like this who presents with what ultimately is a JPA within the thalamus um, might have a difficult time uh, enabling you to get to this lesion. But if you take a supracerebellar infotentorial approach, cut the tentorium, go above the trochlear nerve, the first structure you enter is the pulvinar of the thalamus, which is a structure you can transgress to get to this. This is a surgically curable lesion, and one that through any other supratentorial approach would be difficult to get to. So being creative in the corridors you take and uh, thinking about the entry point that you're using can serve you well and can minimize morbidity to the patient.
uh, interhemispheric approach are, are appropriate for certain lesions. And at our center, we favor dropping one hemisphere down so the patient's head is parallel to the floor. This lets you dissect without using retractors, of course, and get you right down to the corpus callosum and then into the lesion, in this case, uh, adjacent to the third ventricle and the thalamus. We try to use whatever technologies and tools are available to us. You'll see here we're using lighted bipolars. This is all done under an operating microscope. The illumination is excellent, and it's a deep, dark hole that's ultimately difficult to get to. Obviously, we use navigation in all our cases as well. I think to each their own in terms of what's appropriate at your center. Um, but our perspective generally is that if it's going to be useful um, and it's efficient in terms of time utilization, we use it. I, I don't think that um, I need to talk too much about the techniques of intraoperative mapping at this meeting, um, only to say that um, uh, we, we use it increasingly at our center, and um, we really try to take uh, advantage of whatever non-functional corridors exist, whether it means um, removing a lesion on block, whether it means creating windows within the non-functional non corridors to get to the lesion. Um, you know, we try to tailor the approach for each patient and their lesion. In some cases, subcortical mapping is essential and is effectively the whole case. In other cases, it's really the cortical mapping that, that paints the picture. For those of us, I think, in Europe that have seen ALA, the image on the left is, is pretty common for what you'll see in the operating and what you see in publications. Um, this nice, bright, what's called portoporphyrin 9, which is the byproduct of ALA fluorescing, showing you residual tumor. But the image on the right uh, shows you what you can see in low grades, and I think this is another frontier that I'll talk about in a little bit more depth. But effectively, the idea that you can use microscopic fluorescence to really measure tumor burden in real time in the operating room, I think, is the next frontier of extended resection. I mentioned intraoperative MRI because I think there's reasonable evidence for it, um, but it doesn't take into account the cost, the time consumption, and case selection. So there are studies like this that are effectively randomized studies showing you that you'll have decreased tumor burden when you use it. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. Our center has one. We never use it, but um, other centers are more aggressive with it. The data is there, and I think that, like any tool, it has to be used under the appropriate circumstances. The same is true with intraoperative ultrasound. The technology has advanced immensely in the last 10 years, and you can now see lenticular striate vessels deep to an insular tumor before you get within centimeters of it. Um, again, certain centers are more comfortable with this than others. Uh, it's not something that we use at our center, but I think that uh, it's something that we advocate as a principle if it's something that people are comfortable with. And certainly, again, the evidence is there to, to suggest its utilization. Something that I've seen more and more by my colleagues is intraoperative CT, which is sort of the other direction of intraoperative MRI. Instead of going high tech, you go low tech because it's fast and because for certain tumors that are calcified or that contrast enhance very briskly, uh, you can get a sense of what may be left behind. Um, it also is something that lets you accommodate brain shift when you're dealing with navigation and it's becoming misleading. So, you know, the basic skills that we all learned in our training and that we advocate to our trainees are still the ones that serve us best, whether it's positioning, arachnoidal dissection. Microsurgical techniques are really complementary to intraoperative technology. They are not, they don't need to be at odds. You can be anywhere along the spectrum. The question is just how are you using it and are you using it effectively? And I think we're going to see increasingly more visualization modalities for really measuring tumor burden, and we'll talk about that in a second. When it comes to insular approaches, you know, I think um, we've seen the whole spectrum in our field. We have uh, colleagues like Fred Lang at MD Anderson that really, I think, um, uh, feel strongly about a transylvian approach. Um, colleagues like Mitch Berger at UCSF that use transcortical approaches almost unanimously. Um, there haven't been many studies looking at these two approaches and the relative morbidity, and even this study I think is a very limited study, but one by Johann Schramm that attempted to look at what he called medial basal tumors, which included transylvian or, or insulars, and showed some of the perils of going through transylvian corridor when it comes to ischemia related to the Fisher split. Um, Dr. Defoe alluded to a, a way of classifying the insula based on zones where you have 
uh, four zones divided by a plane through the Cillian Fisher and a perpendicular plane through the Foramen of Monroe. And the UCSF group has uh, published several p articles looking at um, surgical freedom, et cetera, when you're taking a trans versus a transcortical route to get to these. We ourselves have looked at and are now putting together our experience with these two approaches. Our center is a little bit unique in that, um, you know, for many years it was purely a trans approach and then gradually it's evolved. Um, the main, I think, difference with the two approaches is, is the utilization of mapping. For a trans approach, usually it's the subcortical mapping that really is most essential, whereas for a transcortical approach, it's first finding a positive control and then finding a negative corridor that you can then use to get down into the lesion and then going through the subcortical mapping paradigm. Um, like I said, in my practice, it's a mixture of the two and it's a case-by-case -case determination. Um, <clears throat> sometimes patients that I operate on really are not good candidates for weight craniotomies and so it limits my, my options. But the goal here is the same, which is to avoid functional pathways, resect to the limits of, functional, of functionality, and at the same time minimize morbidity en route. When you're um, looking at these patients, I think what you worry about the most in both approaches are really diffusion-weighted abnormalities that you'll see in ischemia. Um, when we looked at our experience, you can see that there are selected populations. We tend to use one approach for certain zones more than others, um, one approach for larger tumors more than others. But the extent of resection is relatively similar in this, in this small group of patients. So is the extent of radiographic and clinically significant ischemia. But what was, not, what was different were the patterns of ischemia and injury. And so I think as Dr. Defoe alluded to, this is zone two, which is kind of a posterior, superiorly located insular tumor, is one that's particularly at risk when you're trying to take a trans approach. Because as you could see from the video, you do need to pull up on this, on this frontal lobe to get to that. And you have to split the fissure very widely. And for all those reasons, um, I think certain areas of insular gliomas just lend themselves better to a transcortical approach. So both of these corridors, in my opinion, um, can be used to effectively access the insula. Uh, I favor the transcortical corridor, but I, I think that there, are, there is a role for trans approaches. The, the most common sources of morbidity are what you would expect, and they usually have to do with ischemia, spasm, vascular injury. I think for zone two insular gliomas, there's no question that that's something where a trans approach is probably not appropriate. Now, mapping techniques are really the tool that enables all of this to happen. And uh, in, to my colleagues in the US, many of whom still do not subscribe to intraoperative mapping, I, again, uh, cite uh, this European study led by Philip um, that basically tells us two very simple things that the in use of intraoperative mapping reduces the long-term deficits and it increases extent of resection. And for me, that's all you need to know. And again, I think we need to continue with our messaging so that the overall community subscribes to this. I came to a center that had a very big brain tumor program and no mapping program at all. Well, when I arrived in 2009, we had seven neurosurgeons doing brain tumors, three neuro-oncologists, three radiation oncologists, an entire cohort of specialists. And as our center is one of the only centers in the southwest region of the United States, there's about 1,400 brain tumors operated on by us at three different facilities within the state. So this represents the majority of the southwest United States when it comes to the brain tumor treatment. But when I arrived in 2009, there were no mapping cases done and there hadn't been one done at the center ever. So I had to go through a learning curve in terms of building it. And I think what you've heard today are many masters in intraoperative mapping who have already passed that curve. But what was interesting to me was to look back and see what exactly it looks like to go through this building from the ground up. In the literature, I think we really see two major voices in the domain of intraoperative mapping. One provided by uh, Mitch Berger at San Francisco and his colleagues, and one, of course, by Dr. Defoe at Montpellier. What's interesting is how different these two kind of schools of thought are in terms of how they approach the mapping process. When it comes to anesthesia, they use different approaches. One may not intubate, one may. One may do cases with a sleep mapping, whereas the other rarely does that, if ever, 
One will have the patients universally asleep during resections and one may not. The use of technology is pretty different between these two real standard bearers as well. At San Francisco, uh, fMRI, navigation, the operating microscope, electrocorticography are all routine. In Montpellier, um, you know, I didn't see it when I was there. And the surgical protocols themselves are different. Um, whereas at Montpellier, I think there's, there's a disproportionate number of low grades. In San Francisco, it's kind of more of an even mixture of cases. The mapping sequences used by Dr. Berger are also a lot more rigid and formulaic than, um, for example, what you see Hugh use. And there's, of course, this concept of negative mapping, which effectively just means you never get a positive control and you rely on purely negative results to make your decisions. A sleep motor mapping is something that's still used fairly frequently in San Francisco and not one that I think is used very often in Montpellier. But despite these disparate approaches, their results are actually very similarly excellent. And I think this is where, for those of us trying to build a program, we have to look to see what the process is because these are two masters that have really 20 plus years of experience. So in my experience in building a program from the ground up, there were really four elements, anesthetic, case selection, mapping protocols, technology, that all had to be cultivated individually. And it, as, you, as many of you know, it's not as simple as arriving at a place, throwing down some papers from Defoe and Berger and saying this is what we're gonna do. It really means building a team. And that begins with anesthesia. Um, at our center, we have 12 dedicated neuroanesthesiologists and some of them are more comfortable with this approach than the others. So if you look at the pie charts at the bottom, each slice of the pie represents a different anesthesiologist. And you can see that we started off with many doing few cases and have gradually migrated to a few doing many cases. I think the best metric for success of a mapping program is your intraoperative seizure rate, which if you read the literature should effectively be zero, and it, I think it is zero for Dr. Defoe and for Dr. Berger. Um, but it was not zero when I started. And if you look at the last five years, it, it really has taken some time just to get down to about a 4% rate. Now, this has happened in spite of a decline in our use of electrocorticography. So I think it just speaks to the fact that our neuroanesthetic protocols um, and our operative protocols have just been refined over time. The other thing that's been refined over time is our case selection. Because again, if you read the literature, you may think that Almost any case is appropriate for mapping, and that's very much, I think, how most of us start off the process. But the reality is that there are patients that simply just aren't appropriate, um, whether it's their size, their mental condition, et cetera. And so what I've found is that over time, the proportion of cases at our center that have been mapped awake versus asleep has changed. And we're relying more on asleep motor mapping in cases where it just simply isn't safe to do an awake language case. Uh, when I visited Montpellier, I was struck with the fluidity of Hugues' mapping protocol. It really is, um, it has a lot of science behind it, but it's also very intuitive and instinctive. Um, for me, starting off at a center, that was not something that lent itself to everybody else being able to anticipate my moves. So we initially started with a very fixed protocol where it was literally written down almost to the minute of what to nurses, the operating room staff, my residents can expect when it comes to what's gonna happen next in the case. And that minimized a lot of errors as well. We embrace intraoperative technology wherever it's useful. We look at functional MRI um, through the lens that should, it should be looked at, which is that it provides you very interesting data, but the specificity can vary so much that you can't make surgical decisions based upon it. So we look at that as kind of a roadmap to give us an idea of where we should be focusing our attention with mapping. DTI tractography is the same thing. I don't think you can make millimetric surgical decisions based upon the tractography, but at the same time, it's something that we have in almost every case because it gives you a radar of areas that need to be of high concern. Um, we've really tried to integrate audiovisual components into the operating room so that anytime I'm operating, I see multiple image streams on a single screen. That way, I can see what's happening with the patient, I can see what they're seeing, I can see what's going on with the brain with the navigation without having to swivel my head around or stall the case. And of course, we employ the operating room almost like a laboratory at times as well, and I've, you've seen good examples of that here. Um, here's one device that we've recently used 
that basically uses SSCPs to activate uh, metabolic activity within the cortex and then uses a micro laser Doppler to detect that increase in flow to give you an idea, for example, where the somatosensory cortex is without actually stim using stimulation mapping. Overall, when we put this entire experience together, these are what uh, our results have been over the first 200 and some odd cases. Uh, if you look at it collectively, it's nowhere near what we see in the literature, which I think is an honest appraisal of what things look like when you're not 20 plus years into this process. However, if you look at it year by year, you can see the incremental improvement and you can see that after five or six years, we are on our way to that kind of trajectory. So my message really, and I think to this audience, it, it, it probably is preaching to the choir, but to the general community, is that there is no reason not to have a mapping program at your center. It does require a true multidisciplinary approach, a true partnership with all the specialties and the institution. And these sub 2% rates of seizures and neurological deficits that we see from really the masters and luminaries in the field are achievable, but certainly I think in our experience will take five to 10 years at least of intensive work to get to it. Now, a lot of these techniques are really at the end of the day about safety and extent of resection. And if you ask me what the future of extent of resection is for low grades, I think it's gonna be really microscopic measurement of tumor burden. Just like in non-CNS disease where you take margins at the resection biopsy, for example, and are able to assess tumor burden, I think we're getting there with low-grade gliomas as well, and high-grade gliomas, because here are two cases, a low-grade and a high-grade, both of whom have received ALA, which as you know, fluoresces as protoporphyrin 9 in all glioma cells, and in neither case do you see any real meaningful fluorescence. Now, it's not because there's not tumor there, it's because we have limitations in terms of what our eyes and what conventional operative microscopy can detect because as you get further and further away from the margins of a tumor, the cell density goes down, and the amount of portoporphyrin is just not enough for you to detect with your eyes. And for low grades, this is always the case, because unless there's an area of focal transformation, you're not gonna see fluorescence in a low grade case, and that's why nobody uses it for low grade tumor. But I will say this, um, the, the, the 5ALA biomarker itself is exceptionally useful. Um, I think if you have the right tools and approach. So we've started using a, what's called a handheld intraoperative confocal to detect microscopic fluorescence in real time. Uh, this is a device that actually can give you a heat map of the cell density of fluorescence that you see at any margin of the tumor resection cavity. Now anytime you're looking at things with this kind of sensitivity and specificity, the first thing you have to ask yourself is how reliable is this biomarker? What's amazing is that at a cell by cell level, ALA just happens to be probably the most specific biomarker we have for gliomas outside of EGFR V3 and IDH1, neither of which are readily accessible in the operating room. And our laboratory and others have looked at these cells, purified them, shown that each individual portoporphyrin 9 positive cell shares the same genetic signature as its parent tumor, that these are not microglia, that these are not endogenous stem cells, that these are not endogenous glial progenitor cells and um, that very simply, if you're seeing fluorescence, it's, from a clinical perspective, as good as, as certain that it is a tumor. Our first efforts to develop technology were in partnership with Zeiss. And they really involved a handheld device that looks like this, that was navigable in the operating room. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the OR itself, you could basically point and shoot with this device. And by pointing at any particular margin of a resection cavity, you would see these kinds of images, which granted were not great at the time, which was a few years ago. But you could validate that when you did see these kind of starry cells, that in fact they did represent true gliomas. And we published our initial experience with this showing that uh, you would see at all points of a case this microscopic fluorescence. And then in certain points, even when you thought you were done based on your, your, your idea of the radiographic results, that there is still measurable and detectable fluorescence at the cavity, and in some cases you were able to go further. So I think when we talked earlier about, you know, what is a supertotal resection? Is it five millimeters? Is it two centimeters? I think in the future a supertotal resection is going to be a certain threshold of cell density that we're seeing at a margin and that we're seeing in real time intraoperatively.
Now, the technology has advanced in our hands, and this is a first-generation image from a single-axis confocal. We've now moved to what's called a dual-axis confocal, which is basically something that gives you a better working distance, more clarity, less scatter, and I won't, I won't belabor the bioengineering optics of it, but um, the bottom line is that you can see two images side by side here, the single axis confocal on the left and the dual on the right. Not only do you see the cells better, and here you're beyond the radiographic margin of the tumor, but you actually can see cell morphology, which is pretty amazing. Um, you can use this device to look at anything. You can look at microvasculature, you can look at normal versus abnormal, et cetera. And you can use it to look at multiple fluorophores, because while ALA is what we have currently, there's no doubt that we're going to have other fluorophores in the future, whether they're labeling specific biomarkers or not, and you need to have a device that can look at any frequency. So for me, fluorescence-guided surgery, even though it's probably old news in Europe, is something that's really just being born in the United States. And while it's really useful for high grades to a certain extent, I actually think the most util utility for it is for low grades. I think that for high-grade tumors, we're actually pretty good at resecting those lesions. Uh, but for low grades, we can be a lot better. And these intraoperative devices, whether it's Raman spectroscopy, intraoperative confocals, et cetera, will really give us quantifiable metrics for the first time. Now, um, I just want to end with um, a little bit of a pivot. Uh, I'm a brain tumor surgeon. And I subscribe to every philosophy described today. Um, extent of resection is critical. But I think we all have to remind ourselves that, for the most part, these are not local diseases. And while we may have good radiographic results, we all understand what's going to happen over time. And so I think, really, it's our responsibility, as much as we talk about surgical approaches and the philosophies behind that, to really be very participatory when it comes to the other therapies for low-grade gliomas. Now, you know, the history of glioma adjuvant therapy is, is uh, not impressive, to be honest. And if you look at it from any other oncology perspective, we're not doing very well. Obviously, we have a few items that could add a few weeks to months, depending on the, the, the disease type. Gliadel wafers, you know, we don't use that so much, but it exists. Temozolomide obviously has some benefit, although for low grades, I think the jury's out. Uh, some of you may remember convection-enhanced delivery trials, like the PRECISE trial that delivered um, IL-13. These were massive studies that were really undertaken with the best of intentions that turned out to be negative. I'm sure most of you remember the recent studies for hygrogliomas with bevacizumab, massive studies performed in Europe and in the US. Both studies had almost the same results, and both studies were negative. Each time this happens, it takes the wind out of our sails. And this is a lot of effort, a lot of, obviously, resources, and a lot of, a lot of hard work from people that are trying really hard to move the needle. You know, immune approaches are now the thing we hear about the most, primarily because of the success these drugs have had for melanoma and other disease types. But some of the most promising approaches for us haven't worked. EGFR V3 vaccine uh, from Celdex has been ineffective. The first immune checkpoint inhibitor studies have now been reported, and um, at least this one from BMS has been ineffective. And these studies have got, gotten shut down and also, again, taken some of the momentum out of our field. What's interesting is that we become more and more daring, and I think the threshold for what is uh, attainable in terms of a trial design has lowered. So we have studies where we're being very aggressive with, for example, viral gene transfer studies that actually lead to patient deaths from the, from the actual therapy itself. Now, in any other cancer type, this would be relatively unacceptable, but because we are so um, ambitious, uh, we're really putting some patients at risk. Now, from my perspective, what we're sort of um, getting away from is really our genetic understanding of the disease, which has traveled leaps and bounds, but just hasn't been translated. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that's something that I look forward to hearing more about at this meeting tomorrow. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, there are certain narratives that I think exemplify our struggles as a field. Woody Allen once said 80% of success is showing up. Uh, I think that's a lesson we've learned the hard way when it comes to adjuvant chemotherapies for gliomas. And let me just give you a brief narrative um, on this you know, tumultuous relationship between EGFR and gliomas. EGFR, as you know, is a very prevalent biomarker for gliomas. It's one that's central to its pathogenesis. 
uh, whether it's an amplification or mutation. Uh, it's something that you see fairly often in high gliomas. Um, while its prognostic value is unclear, it clearly is an obvious choice for a targeted inhibitor. And for other cancer types like non-small cell lung cancer, it's been effective. Now, our field as a whole responded to this very bravely and I think um, effectively or at least intuitively early on with early phase one studies that showed some promise, as they often do. <clears throat> this is primarily for high-grade gliomas. And then it, we pivoted very quickly to randomized studies. And the, the first randomized studies for drugs like erlotinib uh, really were unimpressive for whatever reason. Now, if you look at the data for this narrative for EGFR and these targeted inhibitors for the drug, the preclinical data was pretty impressive. You would see everything that you would expect to see from a drug that's supposed to work. It would get into the brains of these animals. If you put it in cells, it would give you the right kind of cell cycle shutdown. If you put it in xenograft animal models, it would give you the right survival profile. So everything at the preclinical level, in addition to the data we had from other cancer types, told us this is something we needed to pursue. And so when those initial monotherapy studies were ineffective, naturally, this, the, the assumption was that there was some resistance mechanism happening and we needed to combine drugs. And there were a variety of ideas in terms of what to combine. And one of the first was a RAF kinase inhibitor, which again was con conducted in a study by some very intelligent people um, who effectively found that there was really um, not a very good response. But our efforts to kind of push this envelope forward continued. And we continued to use combinatorial therapies, throwing drug after drug with what we thought should be a sure thing based on the biology of our understanding of the disease. And all of these studies were really negative. And you know, this, this required a lot of patients to be enrolled and a lot of resources. It was only when I think a very um, small group of insightful scientists and investigators started to look at the underlying issues um, that we started to understand what the problem was. And the problem was, you know, broadly put, kind of two issues. One was drug penetration and our inability to optimize that at the time. And the other one by Monica Hegu, I believe is here, and I think is really, this is one of the best papers I've ever read, quite honestly, um, looked at the molecular downstream effects of this drug. And what she and her colleagues really showed us was that even when you get the drug in, and it does exactly what it's supposed to do according to our understanding of the disease, the downstream effects of the inhibition of this receptor are not what you would expect. And the cascade of events that are supposed to happen when you shut it down were not happening. So obviously this would have been nice to know before all of these studies were undertaken, but it took us a while and some, it took some very smart people to come up with a study design that enables you to figure this out. So from this, you know, very truncated narrative I gave you, I think there's a few lessons hidden within it. The first is that glioma animal models and preclinical models are very helpful, but they are not the truth. The disease in humans is different than the disease in, in, injected in a mouse head. Uh, drug delivery has always been and continues to be a central challenge, not a peripheral one. And the drug effects for many of these agents are not only disease specific, but they're species specific. So the drug effect in a human will and can be different than in any other animal model. So at our center, this has really led us to a program uh, really pushing forward a specific trial design called the Phase 02 clinical trial design. And effectively, this is a trial designed to figure out two things. Does the drug get to the tumor, and does the drug modulate its target effectively? Red light, green light. If it's not doing both, there's no point in going further. From our perspective, this is a study where you're getting as close to precision medicine in our field as you can, because patients get the drug before surgery, and then at the time of surgery, they have tumor tissue, blood, CSF, enhancing, non-enhancing tissue sampled, and within a couple weeks, we answer these questions for that patient. And if the answer is green light for that patient, then that patient goes on to the phase two component. And if it's not, then that patient is immediately off the study and can go on to any other trial. So for our center, which is um, you know, a pretty heavily surgical center, 
this kind of trialing really lends itself to our strengths. And so we've partnered with other institutions and tried to leverage as much of our surgical volume as possible, not only for gliomas, but for other tumor types into this. So let me give you a brief example in the last couple minutes. Cell cycle checkpoint inhibitors are common. The reason they're common is because these are relatively simple targets. You have two arms of the cell cycle uh, kind of checkpoint system, one of which is often defunct in gliomas, which forces it down another through a choke point, called the, which is mediated by a WE1 kinase. So targeting this kinase is a very obvious way to target cell cycle mechanisms and inhibitors within, within gliomas. We know that the kinase is important in gliomas. We know that if you target it, you get the right kind of responses. And we know that there's a first-in-class agent originally developed by Merck that targets the we one kinase. A trial design for something like this, which we just reported uh, and presented at ASCO uh, over the summer, um, really involves a patient having a tumor recurrence, getting enrolled, getting a single dose, one pill of the drug, some number of hours before their operation. And exactly those number of hours after that pill is swallowed is when that tumor comes out. They have a couple blood draws. And then there's another cohort of patients where that single dose is at a fixed dosing. And what varies is the interval from the dose to the time of the operation. When you have all of these data points, you can ask questions in a very specific way about whether this drug is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And in fact, all of the preclinical data for this drug told us it was not getting into the brain, it would not get into humans, and it would not have the right pharmacodynamic effect. But we didn't think that that should be the case based on the drug properties, and we thought that that was an artifact of the animal modeling. So this is what the data looks like in humans, and the data is actually resoundingly positive. The drug gets into the brain very effectively. The, the amount of unbound drug, which is really the pharmacologically active drug, is very high. And the ratio of tumor to plasma is, is, is very good. So uh, the drug itself also seems to have a molecular effect. So again, the we one kinase, the way it works is that it phosphorylates what's called CDK1, which then puts the cell into a cell cycle arrest, which is a protective mechanism for these glioma cells. And, it, and it's such an important mechanism that it was the, the basis for the Nobel Prize in 2001. And this was work done in yeast. It wasn't done in glioma cells. But people knew then that this was such a downstream event that it had to be important for cancer as well. So when you have this inhibitor, it prevents this phosphorylation event, which in turn prevents the cell cycle exit, the cell bounds into mitotic entry, and then it falls apart. And this is exactly what we see in these patients after a single dose. We see the phosphorylation events go down, the cell cycle entry go up, and the apoptotic events go up as well. So this was really a proof of principle, I think, for our field, uh, that these kinds of studies can be done fairly routinely. And so we now have, among other studies, a study for low-grade gliomas, this one with a drug uh, that targets a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Again, a drug with what seems to be positive attributes that would make it favorable for this kind of study and for CNS disease in general. And a drug that could be applicable to a certain portion of liver glioma patients. And this is what happens on a, on a daily basis with these trial patients. And this is a patient from last week where we basically get the PD data, the PK data, all within, in, in, within several days to a week or two. And we can make a decision for that individual patient. And we can put that patient on the drug with some confidence that there should be some effect. and then having a, some measure of standard therapy and having recurrence, and maybe at that point, the patient goes on any number of directions, whether it's re-resection, off-label therapy, clinical trial, et cetera, all of which is done kind of haphazardly, depending on the center you're at. What we try to do is really just look at these gliomas as, as a container of different pathological mechanisms that can be targeted. We try to identify drugs that are actually effective at targeting these mechanisms with the intention to combine them as double or triple therapies so that we can really force the disease down certain pathways and prevent escape. So 
I think if I had to sum up sort of the arc here, you know, tumor biology is really the, the common denominator to everything we've talked about today. Extent of resection can improve that, um, and at least, at the very least, it changes the microenvironment, if not the actual biology itself. Insular gliomas, I think the approaches need to be tailored. I, I, don't, I don't have a one-size-fits-all approach to it, um, but I think technique and technology can both be used effectively to improve extent of resection. Again, I think to this audience, building a mapping program is perhaps nothing new, but to my colleagues in the United States, it's still something that's relatively uncommon relative to the proportion of cases being done. A future metric I think we're all going to be talking about is tumor cell density and actual tumor burden uh, instead of radiographic criteria as a measure of extent of resection. And I've sort of introduced to you or probably reminded you of the concept of these phase zero trials as a real vehicle for advancing drug discovery in low-grade gliomas, and hopefully in future meetings, we'll be able to talk about actual therapies to complement our surgical approaches. So with that, again, I'll thank the organizers and you for your time and attention.